Good morning and welcome to the Gospel Loft. This morning we are reading a book together. The title, When Angels Let You Fall and God Picks You Up Again. We are coming to the fifth part and chapter 9 and 10. But like always, chapters begin with a scripture. And here we have a scripture from John chapter 8 and verse uh, verse 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Yes, it's true. And then there was Cynthia Cecil, an English lady with the best accent and manners. She was one of Annette's customers. Her husband was a civil engineer and very sick in hospital at the time. He had been working in India before coming to South Africa and had picked up some rare disease on the subcontinent. Cynthia was on the same searching path as we were, looking for God, yet somehow bogged down on the way. Traditionally, she, she, she was an Anglican and had a little more knowledge about biblical things than what we had. Well, and one day Cynthia comes to the shop full of fire and excitement. Vicky, she shouted, I have found the church for us. Well, when Cynthia says that she has found the church, then it must be true. Where is the church, my wife asked, already infected with a measure of excitement. In observatory. What, in observatory? People of lower social standing lived in observatory in those days. God has had no time yet to deal with our snobbism. We, we still judge people according to where they lived, where they went to school, how much money they had. Well, we were not top snobs, and we never asked how old the money was. Well, we were not that bad then. It was something that was inoculated into us over generations already, probably because of the double barrel name of my father-in-law, Montenay Wright. Then Lanskaya, a good Russian name, and not last nor least, that frightful Wulschläger family tree that reached down to the 14th century. Nevertheless, it did not need much convincing that we drove to observatory. The next Sunday morning, don't forget, it was Cynthia who told us about it. And so it was, and what an experience. How does one describe such an event. Sunday morning, 9.30, AFM Observatory. The worship is in full swing. The people are singing. and I mean, they are singing. They, they, they clap their hands to give some rhythm. Some moved like in a dance. It was jazzy, all right. Then someone shouted, Amen, praise the Lord, and another uttered, Hallelujah. The song subsided and it was quiet for a moment. Then came this voice as if it was from the rafters. Someone spoke in an unknown tongue and it sounded as if God himself had spoken. Then a moment of quietness again and another voice was heard. Thus said the Lord. Why is God speaking to me? How does he know my troubles? My eyes were fixed on the wall in the front of the church. A Bible verse was written on it, a verse that would never leave my memory again. It was from Second Chronicles, chapter 7 and verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Then came the sermon, an elderly pastor, Eric Wilson from Australia. He took up his place in the pulpit, and I still remember some of his words. After every Israelite, he says, had brought his bull for sacrifice of a burnt offering, there was nothing left but bull ash on the altar. And when you bring today your pride to the altar of God, then tomorrow is nothing left of it, not even a handful of bull ash. God has put your pride into the folder of all 
that is forgotten and forgiven. You have brought nothing to the table, just your repentance. <laughs> that, that was the essence of his sermon that day. Oh yes, God had to deal with pride in our life. And then all came to an end. The service had finished. I had to get out of there as fast as possible. I needed a goloas. My wife and I were on the same page. Let us go home as fast as possible. Fill a glass with wine and never return to this place ever again. What was Cynthia thinking? taking us to such a place. Seven o'clock in the evening came and we sat precisely in the same place where we sat this morning at the AFM in observatory. We drank the word of God with a great thirst. A seed had been planted which had to be watered. A spiritual seed began to grow as if we were pregnant with God's word. A birth had to take place. And here we've got the scripture for it. John chapter 3 and verse 3. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then verse 5. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Well, the kingdom of God was still shrouded in mist, but I wanted it. I wanted to find it and experience it. I was seeking this spiritual birth with all my heart. We bought ourselves Bibles. Nothing was more important than the words that were written with the finger of God for us. It felt as if a bag full of different letters were cast out before us and these letters became words and sentences and paragraphs, then stories with great meaning. Life began to become meaningful for the first time in our lives. It wasn't me who was the center. It was God and his grace. But there was still that mighty river between him and me, and I had to find the bridge to cross it. Then the whole creation began to shout, I am the I am. And we read it, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God's answer to them that say there is no God is very short. The fool says in his heart there is no God. These people represent a multitude of humanity and God calls them fools. They paint the whole creation with the wrong color. Pastor Eric Wilson was an expository preacher. And his sermons were food for the soul. I learned something vital from him. He said, well, I remember this for the future. What you can write, you can also preach. Well, in those days, the thought to become a preacher was far, far from me. Every Sunday, we drove to observatory in the morning and in the evening. The evening services were evangelistic and called the sinner to repentance. I had badly trespassed against God. And he calls it sin. To reform yourself and to become humanly good gets nobody into heaven. That's what I learned. And again and again I was confronted with the Bible verses which troubled my soul. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It says there also. I have sinned. It is stated clearly and the consequences were simply as, as anything else. It, it closes the door that gives entrance to heaven. The whole thing becomes personal and it speaks to me, to my wife, to my children, my siblings, my parents, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles, my grandparents and my neighbors and my friends. We all are going downstairs at the end of our lives unless we find the bridge. 
Jesus who paid the price with his own life. That's the bridge. It became real to me and I began to tell our friends about it. Oh, they smiled all knowingly. When? Ah, oh, he will come down from cloud nine again soon. Just give him time. He's an artist. It is just an artistic phase that he's going through. Soon he will become his normal self again. They harbored a genuine hope for me, but their wish came never true. Werner became never so-called normal again. The other verses, Romans chapter 6 and, six and verse 23, and there it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. After all that I now knew, where death has come from and how to overcome it. It is the righteous payment that we receive from the dark treasure, the dark treasure chest of God. Should we not accept the free gift of life which he has offered to us through Christ Jesus? One Sunday morning the time had come. I needed that Redeemer and he was preached to me and to my wife that morning. Take that step of faith and put your sins before God, whispered the Holy Spirit. The preacher encouraged all the hearers to make right with God that morning. Both of us, my wife and myself, we responded to the preacher's call. We went to the front of the church, knelt down and confessed our need for forgiveness. Jesus, we have sinned. So much before God and man that we cannot remember it all. We ask for forgiveness and a cleansing from all sins through the blood of Jesus, which you have shed for us on the cross of Calvary. Change our life. Make us free. You alone we want to serve. Amen. That was the prayer. And the unthinkable happened. God changed us in a twinkling of an eye and gave us the assurance in our heart that we would enter heaven one day. Suddenly we knew what it meant to be born again. But before we went to the front, we told our children that they should wait for us in the pew as we were going to give our hearts to Jesus. And when we returned to our seats, our son was the happiest child on earth. He had thought that they would take our hearts out of our chest and sacrifice us, that we would die. In a way, we died to sin that day and experienced firsthand what it meant to be a child of God. John chapter 3 verses 7 and 8 says, Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goes. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. So it was with us. We felt really free for the first time in our life, washed and transformed. Family and friends were baffled and very skeptical. It was as if they were uncertain when they came near us and tried hard to stay away. It could have been contagious. Then one Saturday afternoon we had some visitors. It was the youth leader of the church in observatory and two of his friends. His name was Paul M Mustard or Mustard. The first thing that he said as he entered the house was, Oh, my hair is standing up in my neck. What kind of evil spirits do you have in your house? It was a little insensitive, I thought, even offensive. He looked around the house and saw the African masks which I had bought in Kenya hanging on the wall and the Lechentala masks on the front door, which was known to me as a replica of my mother-in-law. And he saw the brass Buddha on the windowsill, and the horoscope on the table, and perhaps much more. He took the Bible out of his bag and he showed us what was written in it concerning all these things. 
and what sort of spiritual influence they can have on someone's life. We had no idea about these things and bundled all these foreign tokens of the heathen together and we burned them in the backyard. We made a bonfire. The Buddha suffered the axe. At first the stuff just would not burn. First a yellow cloud, then a blue and an orange and a green came out of the fire. With strange sounds of resistance, the heat eventually overwhelmed the masks and the literature and turned into ash. A thousand demons danced out of the fire and left. After that, the whole atmosphere in the house changed and everything felt much freer and better. Peace had taken up its position in our home. Paul and his friends prayed for us and bound all these strange spirits never to return. And when Jesus makes us free, we are free indeed. A big step towards God was achieved that day. <clears throat> but the French cigarettes were still ruling my life. This addiction was not yet tamed and driven out. For this I needed a miracle. The white, oblong, and round rolled up in paper tobacco sticks had a tremendous hold on me, even day and night. To me, they were a kind of comfort, yet at the same time a master of my life. And here I would like to read something from Exodus 34 and verse 7. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will in no way clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children. Unto the third and fourth generation. Until next time, when we do chapter 10 together. <laughs>